Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. Big, big, long-form edition of the pod right now. I'm really excited to dive into the history of the Greek mob landscape and how it, you know, dovetailed and intersected and, you know, was a part of the American La Cosa Nostra. I'm going to bring on the preeminent expert on Greek mobsters in America, my friend, Nick Christopher. Nick, thank you for joining me. Oh, Scott, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, good seeing you again. The last time we saw each other was in Vegas. Yeah, it's been a while. That was a, that was a blast. Yeah, that um, was- <laughs> and uh, I remember we were talking, to, we were breaking down some some Greek mob guys uh, there, too. And yeah, uh, yeah, did. My, my knowledge has actually probably grown since the last time I spoke to you, so I'm excited. Uh, Nick's uh, put out a number of books. Mm-hmm. He has his own... Um, content platform and uh is somebody that you'll you'll see out and about at various premieres and um you know influencer events when it comes to the subculture here nick's a guy that knows a lot of different people in a lot of different cities so we're excited for him to share his knowledge so nick let's we should we start in new york city yeah i guess so that's my my hometown so I know a lot about it. <laughs> yeah, so how, so tell tell us how you got interested and where were the first kind of stories that you you gravitated to uh, to kind of learn about or live firsthand and then tell the world about. Um, well, I, to start off with, I mean, I got I was in, enticed by that world because I was kind of around it. Um, when I was thirteen, I was in a gang. When I was thirteen, and um, so that was my first kind of like I guess you know. I want to say mob stuff, but, you know, street gang level. Uh, so I got involved in that, uh, got pinched when I was 21. So I, I kind of knew that world a little bit. And then on top of that, at 13 years old, um, my dad had a cafe, and a lot of those guys used to come in, like New York guys. Mm-hmm. You know, we had um, Booby Sasani from Sonny Black's crew. Yep, from the uh, Bonanos you saw in the movie uh, right. Donnie Brasco. That's correct. The guy James Russo played his played guy. played right. They called yeah. him. They didn't call him Booby in the movie for whatever reason. They, he didn't want to give up his name. They called him Polly. Yeah, but the funny you know, the funny story behind all that. Um, when after the movie was made, uh, Booby came into the cafe one day. Me and him were sitting down talking, and he says to me, "You know about that movie, right?" I'm like, "Yeah." He says, "Do you know I sued him?" I said, what do you mean you sued them? He said, I sued them for defamation of character. I said, you're kidding. He says, and and what happened? He says, I won. (laughs) Because the reason being is they put his character, I mean, a lot of people who saw the movie. Yeah. I mean, not, I don't talk about regular people. I'm just talking people in that, in law enforcement and that world. Um, They, especially law enforcement, you know, because they put his character at a scene of a murder. Right, they put his character at the scene of the three capos slain, which at the time had not been solved. It was solved in 04, 05 when Joe Massino flipped and gave right. everyone up. But when the movie came out in 97, that had, that was an unsolved crime. Yeah, let alone it never happened like that to begin with. The whole movie, right, and that, and right, exactly. And that's not how it happened. The movie was wrong from the beginning to the end. To right. begin with. I, can, I can rip that thing apart. But the thing is that, you, as you know, there's no statute of limitations for murder. Right. So they put him at the scene of a murder, and uh, that's why he won, because he said, you know, you put me in this situation, and you know, uh, you're going to jam me up. That's not good. So it's pretty funny how that happened. Yeah. Um, but then so, so- him come in. We had um, I was very good friends with the Arena faction, uh, yep. Vic Arena, and all his yep. sons. Great guys. Vic, yep. was, Vic was a doll. He used to come in there. And my shop, say hello to my dad. He was they were Queens, fat. they were Queens guys, right? Long Island. Uh, what is it? Vic, was, Vic was Long Island. He lived two oh. blocks away from me. But wasn't wasn't the um again I, I might be uh, showing my my naivete. Uh I thought that Arena and Gotti got close because they were both Queens guys. Well he's a well Vic originally is a Queens guy, yeah. Okay, that's what I meant. Okay. Oh, that's what I know what you, but at yeah. the time, you're saying at the time they were he was in yeah, but at the th- he he yeah. had a home on Long Island, like three blocks away from my house. So I knew them well. You know, besides coming to my dad's store, I used to go to the house, hang out. My brother played football with the younger brother. Uh, so we knew each other. Um, then we had Angelo Ruggiero, 
who had a mm-hmm. house right by my dad, not far from my father's cafe. He came in there once or twice. And then we had another, we had two other guys. Uh, let me think. We had Nikki, the other guy, Nikki Masson, who's I'm not sure is around anymore. Uh, it was not like a made guy, really. He was more of an associate, sort of like a Henry Hill kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was like a bookie. He used to come there and take, sit by, by the, my father's, where my father uh, was working and take bets from over there. And then we had another guy, Sally, who owned a pizzeria, of course, uh, in Manhattan. And when he used to come into the shop, uh, when when I was you know I was young, I didn't know what was going on at 13, 12, 13 years old. So this guy comes into my shop, came behind my came behind, sorry, came behind the counter, and would go in the back of the office of the shop. And I was like, "What are you doing?" I'm saying to myself, "What is this guy doing? This don't work here." So I, I said, "Dad, where's this guy going? Don't worry about it." That was the answer. Don't worry about it. So when you tell a 13-year-old kid, don't worry about it, he <laughs> wants to know. He wants to know exactly what happened. Yeah. So I realized every time he left, he would keep put an envelope on top of the cash register. So when nobody was looking, I went to see what's in there. So what I found was football tickets. If you remember those long football tickets? He used to before, everything, before everything was digital. Yeah. It was these small football sheets, and guys used to circle. Betting, betting sheets. Right, betting sheets. Yeah. And – I said, oh, now I see what's going on. So I took a Betty, I took one of them every week. I took one and made copies of the library. And I used to have the kids in school bet with me. That's awesome. <laughs> Until my father found out, I said, I want to kick my ass. He said, are you insane? You know who's, who's these football shits come from? It's yeah. not from Sal. <laughs> it's from the guys downtown. Are you insane? Yeah, there, there was a... Just I don't know why it just popped in my head, and I, I I'm sorry I'm bringing this back to me, but I, when I was in high school, I wasn't involved in this, but there was a school in my area that something kind of similar happened where these kids were running like um like a winner basketball book as just like 18 year old kids, and they didn't realize who they were laying off with. Oh, and, or maybe they did realize <laughs> and they were laying off with like some serious dudes. Um, nobody ended up getting hurt or anything, but it, you know, some kids, some 18 year old kids had to like, you know, take pinches and um, just because oh, wow. they, because they thought they, they were being, you know, uh, you know, big shots around their high school in Farmington and Hills, Michigan, <laughs> That's pretty not cool. realizing that people higher up on the food chain. Mm-hmm. Well, the thing about the demo, what my dad was trying to explain to me, he says, you know, if you've got these guys betting with you and you're making, you know, you're making bank on this and nothing's getting kicked up, kicked up to, you know, who, and they find out that you're profiting from their sheet, they're right. going to hurt you. Yep. You're going to be insane. Sally never found out. Sally never knew. <laughs> Thank God. You know, so uh, that was, uh, that was uh, my little tiny experience as a young kid. Um, Growing around, you know, growing, growing up around these guys, you know. Uh, as I got older, I still hung out with them. I went with Booby to Atlantic City, and uh, I had a funny experience with him because we were uh, – he was playing, I think it was blackjack or or poker. I wasn't sure what. And he – I'm just standing there. I'm not playing. I'm just hanging out. So he screams to me, and he goes, Greek, come over here. I said, what's up? You got five grand? I said, do I don't like I have five grand? What are you talking about? I don't got five grand. And he goes, okay, what do you got? I said, I got about two grand. He says, give it to me. I said, give it to you. Why? He says, I'm winning here. Just give me two grand. I said, all right. So I gave him the 2,000. He wins. He wins like, I don't know. He walked away with like 30, 40 grand. So we're driving back to, we're driving back to New York. I said, hey, who? He says, yeah. I'm looking at him like, What's going on? I'm, I'm expecting a cut, right? So I'm like, you know, he says, what do you mean? What do you mean you know? So you know exactly what I'm talking about. The two grand. He goes, oh. Oh, that. I oh, you, you want, <laughs> what do you want? You want a cut? I'm like, yeah. I gave you the two grand. You want 60 grand. What's the matter with you? And he goes, uh, consider it a charity donation. <laughs> so I only get nothing back. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it was a funny experience hanging out with him. That's for sure. He was a tough guy. Bobby was really tough. So did did 
did you have any um, run-ins with Spiro? Uh, so, yeah, so in New York City, for people that might not know, there was a, a Greek mob don um, in the, what, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. early 90s, Spiro uh, Valencius? Yeah, what? Valencius, yeah, correct. And uh, there was a, some famous interactions with him and John Gotti. Mm -hmm. And then he's actually in prison right. for at least part of the reason he's in prison is for ordering the murder of a guy named Sammy the Arab, right? Uh, Sammy Nalu, mm -hmm. who has a lot of ties here in Detroit. So I know a lot about it from the Detroit angle. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to, you know, hand it over to you to kind of tell the, tell the listeners and viewers about Spiro um, and kind of his, his, his legacy out by your way. I mean, I'm sure there were Greek crime Lords before him, but in terms of kind of modern day mobology, he's kind of the name that pops up when you talk about New York Greek powerhouses. Well, Spiro, Spiro was around during the late 70s. He came, actually, he was from Boston originally. Okay. And then he moved to New York. Um, the guy who was in power before him was Peter Korakos. Okay. Uh, he was in power, he was Pete the Greek, whichever. And he was in power before him. And Pete was connected with the Lucchese family, with Christy Tick Fanari. Okay. And um, when Peter, and, and Spiro was his driver. And okay. He did a lot of other things for, for Peter, besides being the driver. But then when Peter died, when Peter passed away, um, by natural causes, uh, Spiro took over. And Spiro had about 30, 40 guys under him, you know, that ran Astoria, certain parts of Brooklyn like Bay Ridge. And he was making a ton of freaking money. But Spiro was not known as a violent guy. He wasn't violent. He wasn't, you know, he was a gambler. He was a gambler and he ran gambling dens, uh, what they call Barboot which is a Middle Eastern card, right. uh, dice game. Um, and he ran it with the, uh, under the Lucchese flag. And um, yes, you knew John Gotti. I mean, they all knew each other. I mean, every crew knew each other. But wasn't there a famous tape where John Gotti like, like threatened to cut his head off or something? Yeah, a lot of people don't know what that means. When people, they, they see that on TV, you know, where it's, uh, John Gotti goes, me, I, John Gotti was setting yeah. your motherfucking head off, whatever. People don't know where, where that who he's talking about. Nobody ever explains it on TV or any of the shows, which is unfortunate because that opens a whole other story. Um, Spiro, uh, Sammy Grano went to John Gotti, and John was asking Sammy about this um, this game that was going on, which was close to a Gambino den. And Sammy goes, and Spiro's like, "Who runs that?" And Sammy said, "You know, it's the Greek, you know, Spiro, the boss of the Greeks." And John goes, you know, tell him, me, you know, whatever, the famous line. Yeah. Um, and eventually he did, Spiro did eventually move the game. But prior to that, he was shot at. And they, they were trying to threaten, they were trying to scare him. And he was shot. You know, obviously, he didn't die. But he was shot, him and, him and two other guys. Uh, the shooter, from what I heard and from what I understand, was Dominic LaFaro who was uh, under, you know, Gambino guy. And that was like a warning. And then Sammy talked to John, and John said whatever. And then Sammy obviously went back to Spiro and said, hey, you, know, you got to move this thing, you know. And the reason being is because Spiro got a lot of business. A lot of guys went in bed with him because, you know, Spiro ran a pretty honest game. And um, the only thing is with those, with, with, with those guys, I went to one of the dens back in the day. It was back in the 80s. Um, and I went once or twice. Some of the clubs I actually went to, he ran. He owned a piece of um, where all the Greeks used to go. Um, and uh, it, the only thing about it, with like every other gambling place, if you take a marker out, if you're betting, it's like anything else. You bet, and you're you're betting with their money. And what do you think is going to happen? Right. If you can't pay him back, I mean, come on, seriously. So there was uh, there was one guy, this guy Frank. The Greek guy that owed Spiro money, and um, he got beat up, beat up pretty good. They smashed all his teeth, and he had to get dental work. It was pretty bad. And I have, um, I actually have the recording of one of Spiro's guys going to visit him, 
to say, hey, listen, you, you got to take care of this mark already. You know, and he says, I don't have the money. I don't know what to do. He says, this is crazy. He says, well, don't worry about it. You can come by the, come by the club. You can talk to Spiro. It's okay. Oh, no, no, no. I ain't going to the club. No way I'm showing up there. Impossible. It ain't going to happen. And that guy actually testified to Spiro's trial. So you got the trial was in 92. This is around the same time that Gotti was um, getting taken down, was going on trial. Right. But as you said, uh, Spiro was was under the un umbrella of the Lucchese's. Mm -hmm. And one of the murders um, that he was, um, if, was it the only murder? I think it was the only murder in that case, actually. Uh, yeah. Sam, Sammy Nalu, uh, the order allegedly came no, from, came from no, Vicka Musso. There was no order. That's bullshit. Okay. Well, I want to get, you're the expert. I just wanna, <laughs> yeah. So that's the, okay. That's fine. I mean, that's what people think. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're told. Um, so, so let, let me, can I just give a little, just a little bit of background for people? Sure. Um, Sammy Nalu was a um, Iraqi uh, gangster. Detroit is the home of the Iraqi mafia. Not a lot of people know that uh, an Arab mafia exists, but in Detroit, they've uh, existed for over a half century. They've always worked with the Italians. They're nothing like what you perceive Arab people to be. They don't. They're not religious people. These are Iraqi Christians. They have nothing to do with the Quran or Muslim or, uh, you know, anything um, the Chaldeans, reli religious. Yeah. What do you say? The Chaldeans, right? Yeah, they're called Chaldeans. Chaldeans, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. Right. Uh, but, you know, that just means Christian Iraqi. Um, mm -hmm. And they have a pretty formidable group here. Sammy came with a lot of the... I shouldn't say came, came with all of the Iraqi mob OGs that came into Detroit in the 60s, 50s and 60s, and then early 70s. Sammy was part of that first wave that came over here, uh, eventually made his way, was working, you know, under the Jackalones. So, I mean, this was a, Sammy, Sammy the Arab was a, was a player in Detroit. He went to New York, I think in the 60s. Um, opened up a, a nightclub in Manhattan that was like a really popular place that had like, it was like the first Middle Eastern themed nightclub and it had belly dancers. I forgot what it was called, but it was, it was mm -hmm. a real happening place in the, in the sixties and seventies. But he was also known as a master thief mm -hmm. and he quarterbacked uh, the Pierre hotel oh. robbery the biggest uh, hotel heist in, in world history. And I, I believe I'm, I'm going to tell you my part of it. Then, then we'll hear, then we're going to hear Nick's part of it and then we'll reconcile it all together and have the real story. <laughs> uh, so I think that the seeds from what I understand on my end of it, and I've talked to all the people that were super close to Sammy. Uh, I think the seeds of Sammy Nalu's murder, which which happened in 1988, were planted in the months after the Pierre robbery. He took a lot of that money that was supposed to go to Christy Tick, who was the conciliary or was going to be the conciliary. He took that money to Detroit and he didn't give it to Christy Tick. Um, mm -hmm. And there was some bad blood there, I think, that was building up over the years. Um, and, and, whether or not Vic ordered it or not, Vic was Christy Christy Tick's guy. Oh, you're you speaking about Vic Amuso. Right. Right. Um, yeah, you're right about all that. I mean, uh, Sammy, the Pierre heist was, uh, there was um, uh, Bobby Comfort was part of that. Yep. Um, I forgot the Ali. A bunch, guy. Of guy, bunch of guys. It was, yeah, a, Ali, it was a, I forgot the last guy. The other guy, Ali Habab or whatever. Um, there was, Two, three, so four or five other guys. Donnie, actually, Tony the Greek was involved too. Donald Francos. Oh yeah, Tony the Greek. Yeah, and, Bo and Bobby Comfort was a guy from up in Rochester. Right, and uh, Bo Bobby was uh, sort of like the uh, mastermind of the whole thing, really. Then Donald Francos got involved in this and that, and um, Sammy Nalo, of course, and uh, he that was a pretty famous thing. Really and famous. It wasn't just Sammy that took money. Sammy took money. Two other guys. Ripped everybody off. Donald and Franco's got pissed, and he actually whacked two of them. Yeah, 
And Bobby Comfort, nothing happened. I mean, he got away with everything. You know, he nothing happened to him because he, he didn't steal any money. Um, they actually robbed Sofia Loren's uh, right room, I believe. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, they came, they, they came away with millions, millions of dollars. At, yeah, it's insane. Ten million dollars or something in 1972. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. But um, the thing with the thing with um, Spiro uh, killing Sam and Allo, that whole thing is a joke. Because Sam and Allo was when he got out of prison, Sammy was actually good friends with Spiro. They weren't they right. No, I know, I know, no, I know that. Yeah. And when he got, and actually, the, the their their wives used to hang out together. So when he got out, um, Sammy got a little too, you know, he was flexing too much, and he was flexing around Spiro's joints. He wanted to try to take over something like that. So Spiro went to, you know, the Lucchese's. He went to. Um, First, he went to a gas pipe uh, castle and said, hey, and Vic and Buser, because they were boss and not divorced. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, I got this issue. I got this guy who's bothering me. And Muso and Kaspar said, is he with anybody? And he said, no. He said, well, take care of yourself then. If he's not with anybody, then it's nothing we can do. You know, and Spiro complained. He said, wait a minute. I'm under your flag. I'm kicking up to you every month. And you're not, you can't help me. You know, that doesn't make any sense. So then, so Amuso said, "Okay, you know what? You you pay Picciotto every month, who's a, who's a captain. Says so you kick up to him, take this up with Pete, and make arrangements. Fine." So Spiro went to Pete, and he didn't specifically tell the Pete, "Hey, listen, go whack this guy." That wasn't what he said. He said, "I got an issue with this guy. Can you help me? You know, let's, let's see, take care of this." So what Pete did, what a Pete, fat Pete did, he hired two guys, yeah, Mike, Spinelli, Mike, Mike Spinelli and Richie Pagarulo. Richie Pagarulo to go to Spiro's travel agency where Sammy was supposed to meet Spiro there. And when he went there, they, you know, they whacked him, obviously. And in his dying breath, he was told the police, whoever showed up there, the authorities, that it was Sammy, Steve, uh, sorry, Spiro was on the phone and it was him who set it up. And then he passed away, whatever. And then during um, Spiro's trial, which originally was just for gambling, he could have just went away away for like five years, seven years stint and got out. They tacked on the murder charge. Right. And that is because Fat Picciotto turned on Vic and and Gaspite. Yeah. And they shot him 12 times at a gas station. Because actually, then when they shot him, he didn't flip yet. Right. They thought he flipped. Right. So they, which was a stupid move on their part. So they shot the guy because he was so fat. He was so big. He was like 400 pounds yeah. that the bullet didn't penetrate his yeah. skin the way it should have yeah. a normal. Yeah. Yeah. He right. survived. He shot, shot him at a gas station and shot him like 12 times. And he was the, one of the key witnesses for Spiro's case. And, you know, whatever he said was like like uh, Bible, you know, which is, yeah. I don't know, that the whole case was... Bizarre. I think he definitely got railroaded because there is no evidence, no real solid collaborated evidence that he was that he ordered the hit. Right. Nothing. I mean, did he? They get him on tape saying it. No. Did he? Anything written? No. Did they have any? Uh, did he? Was he there? Did he shoot the gun? No. So, she always the one who ordered the hit. Right. Spiro. So well, you know you know how the government is. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. all. It's all. You know. Uh, Ends justify the means. Yeah, if they need, they want you, they get you. That's yeah. it. Period. Well, so, I always when I I didn't even realize. I knew who Sammy Naylor was. I knew he was killed in New York. I knew it involved the Lucchese's. I had no idea the connection to Detroit. And then over the years, as I've developed more sources in my own hometown, maybe four or five years ago, I was sitting with these guys that I had no clue had any connection to Sammy Nalu. And it turns out that these guys were like his brother. I mean, not as literally his brothers, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was, Oh, I said, I, I thought he was a New York guy. Oh, well, he was, a, he was, but he came from Detroit. So it's interesting. And, and, I, and I'm not by any means saying that there was going to be some, you know, war between Detroit and New York, but it is interesting to point out that when this happened in 1988, not the Italians, but the Iraqis in Detroit, who were surprisingly, I would say, more violent than the Italians in Detroit, 
1988, they were in the middle of a war themselves. Mm-hmm. And I've asked those guys, I've asked those guys, you know, if that wasn't going on, is there any way you guys would have, you know, tried to make a, a, a beef over what happened with Sammy? And they, they can't give me a firm yes or no, but I know these type of guys. <laughs> And I can imagine if they had nothing else on their plate in Detroit and their guy got whacked out like that, I mean, who knows what would have happened? But they had a they had a war here in Detroit, the Iraqis, between 88 and 93, and they were putting people like in wood chippers and stuff. I mean, it was like real brutal, gruesome shit. So, but these were the guys that Sammy Nalu came over to the country or came over to the United States with. Cool. Okay. Um, let's uh go to Philadelphia for a second. Okay. Um Philadelphia had a Greek mob for a period of time. Um, the two guys that were leading it in the 70s and early 80s were Stevie Boris and Harry Petros. Mm-hmm. They were both killed in the same week in 1981, and it was about six weeks or two months after Nikki Scarfo had taken over the crime family in the wake of the chicken man being uh, blown up. Those murders are both unsolved. It's pretty understood that that was Nikki getting everybody in line. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I, I don't want to speak out of school and I don't want to get you in trouble. If you don't feel comfortable talking about this, that's totally okay. okay. I've, I've put it out there and, and I'm not, um, trying to hate or or uh, get in trouble, uh, Georgie Cowboy Martirano. Mm. But the fact is what the fact is. And yep. the fact is the FBI to this day, to 2024, considered Georgie Martirano the top suspect in the Stevie Boris murder. Uh, Georgie Martirano, again, to his credit, has gotten out of prison. He did 30 years on a nonviolent drug offense. Mm-hmm. Longest uh, serving non uh, longest serving drug offender in the history of the federal prison system, minus any um, acts of violence. So nonviolent drug offense. He served 32 years for it. He's come out of prison. He's been out now six, seven years doing just what he did before, but now legally is a master businessman has taken over the entire kind of legal cannabis space in, in Philadelphia and uh, New Jersey. He's living his best life right now. And I'm not trying to uh, demean him or disparage him or, or stop him from doing that. But but facts are facts. Mm -hmm. And it was a brutal murder. Uh, in May of 1981, and it, and it wasn't just the murder of Stevie Boris; it was the murder of Stevie Boris's girlfriend too. Mm-hmm. And it was carried out in front of Raymond Long John Monterano. So this would be if the FBI, if what they believe is true, Georgie Monterano was trying to get a button, was given the Stevie Boris hit as a way to get made into the. Philadelphia, La Cosa Nostra. His dad, according to the FBI, sets up Stevie Burris, his dad and his mom. And two men with ski masks break into a bus into the restaurant, go to the table where Stevie Burris and his girlfriend, Jeanette Curro, is sitting. And Raymond Long John Monterado and his wife are sitting. I'm told that the gunmen were Georgie Monterado and another guy named Frank Vadino, uh, who was Ralph Natal's bodyguard enforcer. Um, and Long John Monterano moves his wife out of the way and points to, to, to Boris and Kuro, like letting the gunman know, kill these people. So if you believe the FBI, Georgie Monterano, Georgie Cowboy, made his bones by killing a Greek mob boss and an innocent woman in front of his mom and dad. That's pretty sensational. Have you heard that? Have you, have you uh, 
reported on that or or deep dove uh, th those those murders? Well, yeah, I mean, I know that's exactly how it happened, pretty much. Um, I mean, Burroughs was was uh, told to go to Melita's restaurant and uh, meet Madurano because he was close to him and he did business with him. And um, he was there to discuss business. And especially, this is, like you said, after Nikki came into power. Uh, Nikki Scarfo at the time was wanted to uh, raise the street tax on everybody. He wanted everybody to get in line. Everybody. So the Greeks, um, Buras and Harry Petros, um, whose son I'm, I know well, um, they um, they ran with, they ran the PCP trade in Philly, and they kicked up to to pry and pry the Nikki. They kicked up to Angel Bruno, mm -hmm. and there was a peace, and everything was fine, and everybody made money, and it was good. Uh, so they ran the PCP trade, and they ran you know loan sharking and some gambling. They had some they had a gambling den in Upper Derby in PA um, with this other guy Petros Patros. Uh, so they. When that happened, and Nikki, you know, requested more money from everybody, uh, the Greeks kept telling us, like, hey, I don't think so. I said, we've been under Bruno for so many years, and it's been known that this is what's, this is what's expected of us. And just because you came into power, you, you want more money now? No, nah, 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 not going to happen. So they kind of told him, like, you know, <laughs> all kinds of purposes, just purposes. No, nah, I don't think so. So that kind of said both of them up, Harry and Steve, for and, the hit. And, and George, Georgie is like, I don't know if he pays attention to my reporting. I don't know if he even knows who I am. But um, I know Georgie is very uh, – being his image is very important to him. He wants to be known as a nonviolent former criminal. Um, he was never – we should be very clear. He was never charged in um, – the Boris Koro double homicide. He was only listed as a suspect. No charges ever came. Georgie never got a button. He went to prison before there was ever an opportunity for him to get made. Mm -hmm. His dad went to prison as well. Um, I want to get your take on this last part of this, the, this story. At least my reporting tells me. I believe, well, first I believe anybody that gets killed in the mob or in the world of organized crime. Most of the time, it's not just one thing. It's a series of things that accumulate. Mm -hmm. um, just like with Sammy Nalu, as we were just talking about. I don't think yeah. it was a series of things happened and then it, it sets the sets the uh, foundation for, for, your, for your demise. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a strong possibility that that 1981 double, double homicide played at least a small role in the decision to kill Long John Martirano in 2002, I believe. Um, Long John Martirano's, uh came out of prison, was bumping, bumping head. Georgie was still in prison. Georgie wasn't going to get out for another 15 years. Um, but Long John came out after 25 years or so started bumping heads with Joey Merlino and that crew. Merlino was in prison, but Joe Legambi, who was his mm -hmm. acting boss. Who was Joe Legambi's consigliere at that point? It was a guy named Joe Crutch Curro. Yeah, that's Jeanette's bro son, brother. Right. Um, so I was told that in the decision-making process to put the contract on Long John's head, Legambi was getting pushed in that direction by his conciliary who held a grudge against Long John and Georgie for what had happened to Jeanette Curro 30 mm -hmm. years before that. Do you take, do you, do you uh, hold, is there any, you hold weight in that? Does oh, that yeah. hold weight to you? I believe that's true. Yeah. I mean, common sense will tell you, you know, first of all, in the mob, you don't kill women. That's the first thing. Jeanette Curl uh, had nothing to do with whatever Buras was doing, and she could have been removed from the scene very easily. Uh, but that they didn't do that, obviously. And killing a woman, especially at that time in 81, where the rules were women and, you know, 
family, but have women, children, or there's not involved that are not involved in that life, uh, you know, are off limits. Um, so, it, like you said, things and things that and these guys they remember things twenty years later. So like they're, they're like elephants. Their yeah, yeah, yeah. memories are, are yeah, yeah. as clear as day a half century later. Yeah, but when they never forget. And then here it is where they killed a wise guy's sister. I mean, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, now, like, now at the at the time, we should tell people Joe Crutch Curl was a nobody at that point. I don't even think he had a button at that point. No, but you I, never, but you never know. A guy that doesn't have a button in 1982 can be in the administration in 2002. Yeah, but I think he had a. I think he was an associate at the time. No, he was an associate. I'm yeah, just so saying he was, that. Yeah. He was under that umbrella. Right. Um, so even an associate still. Right. Same thing. Same rule still applies. I know uh, that Georgie would bristle at this if he's if he's watching this, but hey, again, it is what it is. I that's wish him right. nothing but the best. I hope he comes out. He's not going to get charged for this. If people are, oh, you're putting, you're, I get a lot of people telling me, oh, you're, you're, you know, letting the FBI, you're, you're giving the FBI ideas and you're pushing the FBI towards arresting the, I'm like, no, I'm not. Anything that I'm saying on here or that I'm reporting, the FBI has known way longer than I have. And none, nothing that people in the media report play a role in if somebody gets, indicted or arrested i mean really there might be some small uh, macro connections to media pressure but uh so i don't think georgie martirano is in any way shape or form has anything to worry about a, about a murder charge coming down the but i think people that want to promote him and 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 he wants to promote himself as this very fuzzy friendly like gentleman gangster, it doesn't jibe with that particular part of his career, if you believe the FBI. And again, never charged, never probably will be charged, but the FBI believes that he played a role in that. Well, you know, George, regardless of how he presents himself, and I look, I wish him luck as well, uh, but because uh, he's good, he's actually uh, good friends with my. Uh, yeah, no, I, he's doing great. He's doing great things right now. So you should, for him, I mean that's great. But I'm saying, you know, somebody in that world, you know, they're not. Even though there's no document, you know, I'm not saying he ever whacked anybody. There's no, there's no proof that he actually was there. This is just what we what we right. know and what we've heard. Yep. But we have no solid proof of that, and um, no real evidence. Yep. So, it's that's something that's going to die with history. And Frank Vadino's long dead, so it's the, the alleged accomplice isn't around either. So, yeah. Um, let's uh, let's go to my hometown for a little bit. <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the Detroit Greeks. Um, well, was, believe it or not, there wasn't just the Petros and Budas crew. There was a couple of other guys that were in, in that area. There was uh, Athanasios and Athanasides. We're talking, we're talking about it. We're talking about in Philly, right? That's in Philly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He ran a whole whole drug uh, organization with uh, George Batsaris, um, and they had a crew of, like, I don't know, 15, 20 guys that ran a major heroin ring in Philly. Uh, this was after the Petros and Boros hits. This is way out. This is, like, I don't know, 80, 89, something, maybe a little later. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they all got pinched eventually because uh, they – they, the FBI found paraphernalia in an apartment and they connected it to, to that whole crew. Um, so it had to be like, I don't know, like at least 10, 15 guys, all Greek, mostly all Greeks that, that ran that crew. Um, again, it was after. Um, but, but Cyrus was with Petros in the, he was with that crew. Okay. But a lot of those guys, um, like I said, there are 30, 40 of them. But they, a lot of them after Petros and, and Boros got killed, they like scattered because it was like, oh, you know, we're next. <laughs> you know, right. they kind of dispersed pretty much. You know, just like they did in New York when Spear went away for prison. Same thing. When Spear went away, they were still in, they still had some power under the Lucchese's, but um, not to not to change the subject too much. But this is New York, of course. Right. But um, it changed when the Albanians started coming in, and the Albanians. Came into a story which was a home base of Spiro, right? And they walked into a soccer club, 
which was, you know, Greek owned. And um, they walked in and they demanded that we're taking over now. You know, spill the way. You guys don't have the kind of pull, even though they did, they were under the location flag, but the Albanians didn't think that was anything to worry about. And they walked into the soccer club with AK 47s. And two Greek guys came out from the back with pistols. They looked at the K. They looked at these guys with AK forty seven. Like, oh, okay. Yeah, they, they, I got a gun. I got a bigger gun. Yeah. They put the pistols down. They're like, oh, all right now. <laughs> so that's yeah. when the Albanians. That's when the Alex Rudai and his whole crew right started moving in. And that's when after that's around that time is when he when they went to the war went to war with the Italians. Didn't uh, didn't um uh. Uh, Rudaj had a, a couple of Italians with him too, right? I believe he had a few, two or three guys. You know, one of them was a bodyguard. I'm just but saying they, that those those guys could like run interference with him for him, like with other Italians. Yeah, they probably could have. Yeah, yeah, probably right. could. I mean, yeah, the Greeks had a, um, even Spiro had a Albanian or the guy that the story I told you before, the guy who went to see Frank, his name was Dimo the Albanian. So. They, the Greeks and Albanians do have done business together in the past, um, and Italians and Albanians too. But Rudai at the time had a whole different. He thought he could take over. Yeah, he was. He he. Um, does he have an outdate? He might not be. He might not be. Someone told me recently, maybe that he might be coming home in the next decade. I don't know. Maybe I got to I got to check that. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's. The, I think he was, he was. I think he got. Um, he got life, didn't he? Did he get life? I'll I'll check it out. I could be but, wrong, but I. You know. Um, let me uh, just throw it back to Detroit. Hmm? Or not throw it back, but go to Detroit for a second. Well, if I can throw it back, we've we've gone there a couple times already today. Yeah. Uh, the Greeks in Detroit have always been um, a subunit of the the Toko's really crime family. They've never really had their own thing, but they've always worked. Like they've always been a very important component of the Detroit uh, organized crime group, which, you know, if you followed my reporting and, and historical breakdowns of that group, you know, they're uh, kind of the, the picture of stability and functionality and, and making money, not headlines. And a lot of the, even today, I mean, a lot of the, the activity when you're talking about Detroit proper and not the suburbs, our little Italy in Detroit is Greek town. <laughs> it's weird for people to understand that we don't have a little Italy, but Greek town in Detroit forever has been the main entertainment district. Mm -hmm. um, Monroe street uh, dating back a hundred years. Uh, and if you want to party in Detroit, even today you go to Greek town. Um, and we don't have a little Italy. So that's kind of the, that's the spot downtown. And uh, it was settled, settled by the Greeks and uh, all the, the biggest Greek mobsters in Detroit history came out of that neighborhood and was, uh, were working for the Corrados, the Vitalis, the Jackalonis. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the first big guy that I started to learn about was Peak the Greek um Katranis, oh, yeah. whose sons were mob enforcers one just died the last couple of years uh mike Katranis, they call him they called him greek town mike got to meet him this was a man was this guy tough as nails uh a real og you know beloved into the day he died by the italians um and uh he was very very close to Kid Rock and Uncle Cracker, the uh, rapper rockers that came out of Detroit. I'm not exactly sure how their relationship started, but I know that whenever one or the others would have birthday parties and weddings and christenings and everything, they'd always, they'd all, it, Mike would always be at Kid Rock's and Uncle Cracker's stuff, and they'd always be at Katranis' stuff. Yeah, I think Katranis was uh, Mike was uh, Kid Rock's. Uh, he was the Godfather, the one of yeah, Kid Rock's kids. one of his kids. Yeah, yeah, Chris uh, and one of his kids, which is funny. Uh, from what I heard, Kid Rock was having some kind of issues, 
uh, with distribution with his record or something like that. And, and he asked Mike for help. And Mike, you know, uh, intervened and got it taken care of. Yeah. And, um, that's how they, I think, that's how, I think that's how they became closer, I believe, at that point. And yeah, you're right. They used to go to each other's parties and christenings, birthdays, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that was Mike and it was uh, uh, Pete, the original. Um, and then his brother, Little Pete, Little Pete, who didn't make it out of the 70s, no. um, kind of famously didn't want to fall in line behind the Jackalonis and the Corrados and the Vitalis, was not as um, buttoned up as Mike. You know, Mike was somebody that there was no question about loyalty with Mike or with Pete. Um, Pete died. Right. And so it was just Mike and little Pete in the seventies. Who knows what would have happened if Pete, the Greek was still around because Pete, the Greek didn't have a button because he was Greek, but you might as well have had a button because I, people talk about Pete, the Greek, um, the Italians that I, you know, they all just revered uh, Pete Katranis. One of the stories I heard was that um, he could take a, 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 like a car, like a deck of cards and snap. It in half. Uh, but yeah, little Pete was um, acting uh, pretty rogue. And uh, mm -hmm. the final straw with him was a, a, a sucker, allegedly a sucker punch that he threw at Tony Giacalone's protege, a guy named Ronnie Morelli. Right. And uh, they were all at, I don't know if they were at the, Gre the Grecian Gardens was the big place in, in Greek town where mm -hmm. they were all hang out at. But then there was another place called the Bachelor Quarters. I don't remember if they were Grecian Gardens or Bachelor Quarters, but a little Pete came up to Ronnie when Ronnie wasn't looking and, and, and smacked him. And then a couple days later, allegedly, his own brother was forced to kind of serve him up. Mm -hmm. Um, they found him in the trunk of his car with his hands cut off and, uh, out by where I grew up in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, which is like the, you know, the, you know, like the, where all the rich Jewish people live or rich waspy people, Jewish people. Um, but Mike, Mike was around for, uh, like I said, I think, I think he died in maybe 2021. Yeah. Something like that. But uh, that story is correct. Little Pete was, uh. You know, he was not kicking up like he's supposed to. And he didn't believe that was necessary. And he thought he can get away with it. And, um, uh, you know, obviously he got whacked. He was, and, and he was, he was, he was not kicking up and he was muscling in on guys he had no business muscling in on. Right. He just totally disobeyed any rule, any, you know, and uh, I'm sure, I'm sure I wouldn't doubt it that Mike advised him. You know, stop doing this. You're out of your mind. I, I'm pretty sure Mike had a couple talks with him, oh, saying that you can't do this. Like, and I and I have no. There's nothing I can do, or the fact that our dad was so revered. There's nothing that and either of us can do. Look, our hands are tied if you keep on behaving the way you behave, and you take a swing at at Tony Jack's guy, who Tony Jack had been sending at you to tell you to pump the brakes. You might as well have taken a swing at Tony Jack. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I, mean, I, I can't. I mean, that's like how dumb can you possibly get? Uh, but the really crazy part, as you just mentioned, is that Mike set up his own brother. Right. Uh, which is, I don't it's think he really had a choice. No, I don't think he did either. And yeah. I actually think, not to get too conspiratorial and go down the rabbit hole, we're not going to go there, but I think it's possible that Mike Katranis was killed at the same house that Jimmy Hoffa was killed at. Because um, they are both in Bloomfield Hills, and it was a place that uh, was used for uh, sit-downs. So uh, I think I, I've always heard rumors that maybe that Katranis was told to show up for a sit-down at this uh, house on the hill, uh, and they whacked him there just like they did Hoffa a couple years later. But who knows? Um, yeah. And you definitely know the story. I'm gonna have you tell it, and then I'll color it up after you're done. But the, oh, the story, the, Ernie Kanakis, one of the craziest stories. Whether you're talking any type of right. OC story, um, <laughs> this guy had uh, 
20 lives. Pretty much. Uh, same similar situation, actually, with Little Pete, really. Yep. Because Ernie ran a couple of gambling places and a couple of diners here and there. One of them got shut down, then he opened another one. And, you know, the Italians were like, okay, you got to throw us some cash here and there. And he kind of was not really into that whole situation. And uh, I think it was Ciccaroni who sent three guys. He sent three wise guys. They're a little bit elderly. <laughs> sent three that's, that's actually one of the parts that's most interesting. The hit team that got dispatched to kill Ernie Kanakis were all guys. Two guys were in their 60s. One guy was in yeah. their 70s. Yeah, and right. you got to remember, 60 and 70 today is different than 60. I mean, that, that's like the equivalent of the day of sending some 80-year-olds. <laughs> some kind of stuff like that, you know. And they 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 went to his home, and they had they were gonna have a little talk with him or something. But Ernie knew something was up. He realized, and even before that, before they even showed up, he called another guy, called one of his guys, other Greek guy, Tommy. Yeah, He's Tommy the Judge, Tommy Sledgehammer. right? And uh, Carmanos, I think his last name was. Carmanos. He yeah. told him, "Hey, listen, this is gonna happen. I just want to let you know. If anything happens to me, you know what's going on." He's like, okay, fine, whatever. So when these three <laughs> uh, hitmen, uh, elderly hitmen, the senior citizen crew, came to take care of Ernie Kanakis, he turned the tables on them and whacked all three of them. Oh, he <laughs> killed all three of them. And then one of the guys, this guy that one of the guys in his 70s was like a legendary hitman in Detroit. Now, obviously, he felt like he could still do the work in his <laughs> 70s, but he was a guy named Nick Ditta. And he had been killing people since the twenties, and he was he was like a guy that, that that the Detroit administration used to like send around the country to kill guys. But Nick Ditto was such a badass, so so they go to kill Kanakis. Kanakis shoots all three of them. Yeah. Two of them, two of them are just dead. Nick Ditto is still alive. He climbs from the basement up yeah. to the kitchen. He gets on the phone. Calls 911. 911 says, where are you? This is before there was, you know, the ability to trace you. He, that, he's not in his house. He doesn't know the address. Yeah. He's shot. He's dying. He says, wait, hold on. He craw they, can, they can tell this in the crime scene because of the blood spatter. He crawls out into the porch, gets the, the address, crawls back into the kitchen, grabs the phone, tells them the address, and then when the ambulance arrives, he, he was dead with the phone in his hand. Yep. Pretty crazy. And then after then after that whole thing happened, of course Ernie is like in trouble now, you know, because he whacked three guys. When he get he gets acquitted. He gets acquitted at trial. No, no, I know well, well yeah with the case, but I'm talking about on the street. Yeah, now you're talking about you know, I'm, I'm just still letting people know. So he goes yeah. on trial for for murder, gets acquitted on self defense, mm -hmm. and then it looks like all's good. But it's not. <laughs> yeah. Because now this now the, the mob, the Italian guys Want to want to put a hit on Ernie? So what does he do? Ernie goes to the guys you spoke about earlier. He goes to uh, uh, Kalasho, who is the head of the Chaldean crew. He goes to the, he goes to the Iraqis. The Iraqis, because they were friendly and they knew each other. So the Chaldean goes. Chaldeans basically told the Italians, uh, "He's with us now. It's okay. But you, you can his his slate is clean. Leave him alone." The yeah, the the, the Iraqis squash the beef. But yeah. he's lucky because so this so so the murders happened in the same week as the bicentennial. So it was the first week of July 76. He's on trial, I want to say in 77, beats the case in 77. Then a, almost a decade goes by, and you know, nothing. I think he thinks that he's in the clear. I know he was out of town for a little bit and came back. And then the Jackalones, who don't who have long memories, yeah, don't forget. give give a contract on on him, give a contract for him to their guy Frank the Bomb Bomb Marito, R.I.P. the Bomb. I got the Bomb was great to me at the end of his life. Uh, I I just have nothing but positive things to say about this man, even though he was a killer. Um, Frank the Bomb gets the contract, and. He goes and tries to subcontract it to this hillbilly named Charlie Acker. Detroit has a lot of um, people that came up from Appalachia 
uh, for the for the auto jobs. So you got a, a, a good you know group of people that have southern ancestry, and the criminals in that little world gravitated towards the Italians. So this Charlie Acker guy gets the contract on Kanakis, and uh, he's working for the feds. So <laughs> it's it's uh, the whole thing's foiled before they ever get the contract, and then the Kalashos, Akrawis, um take him in and, and squash the, the beef. But it's interesting that for the Jack Colonies, they wanted, they wanted, uh, Chris, they wanted it as their Christmas present. So they wanted, um, the signal to be that it was done was for Frank, the bomb to send them a Christmas card with a picture of Kanakis' dead body in it. I never, yeah. never happened. Never happened. Well, not. <laughs> uh, and let's, let's uh, finish up here. Let's go to Chicago. Talk about Gussie Alex for a second. Alex. Um, so we want to talk about a underrated superpower legend. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he was probably the most powerful non-Italian in Chicago mafia history. There might be some people I'm forgetting, but he was he was Tony Accardo's uh, fix it man. Mm -hmm. uh, ran the Loop for people that aren't from Chicago. The Loop is the is the downtown business district where all the government offices are or all the high rises, all the corporate corporate uh, headquarters are. And that was Gus Alex's territory from like the forties until the nineties. Yeah. Uh, they, he was, uh, he was part of a group called the connection guys. Uh, Gussie Alex, uh, Murray, Tamil Humphreys. Yeah. Uh, Jake, they all learned from Jake Guzik. Jake Guzik, mm -hmm. Jake Guzik was, uh, uh, Gussie Alex was Gus, uh, Gussie Guzik's uh, protege. Mm -hmm. uh, he learned from he learned from him, and um, Gus was like the number three guy. I mean, he ran the whole political machine. Knew how to bribe guys. Knew ran you know with the judges and everybody. You know how to fix cases and so forth and so on. Um, he was a like, he, and he had his own crew of Greek guys. Believe it or not, there was Gus Zappas. There was. Um, there was a whole crew. I can't remember all the names right now. There's so many of them. That because he ran a little, he ran little pockets of gambling dens yep. around the Chicago area. Yep, North Side. That that Gussie ran, um, but he had other guys to you know run the run the ship, so to speak. And they just kicked up money to him. And he kicked it up to either Joey Weeper or whoever was in power at the time, uh, Tony Accardo. Uh, but yeah, Gus was. They even listed him in Time Magazine as the fiftieth. 15th, 1 5, strongest boss in America. Yeah. So, uh, but like I said, he was so low key, never really made the papers. Um, he used to, but there was one, there was one detective, William Romere, that used to yeah. drive Gus freaking crazy. He Jason used to let Bill Romer, uh, I, I met him at the end of his life. He was a legend, don't get me wrong, but he was also a legend in his own mind. He, yeah, he thought very highly of himself and would uh, make the 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 kind of rivalries with him and the guys he was chasing very personal. Oh, yeah, with Gus, forget about it. Follow him everywhere. And it came a point where Gus was like, every time he woke up, he's there. Like, he's outside of my yard. He's in front. And, he's, and he went and complained to Tony Accardo. He says, this guy's up my ass every freaking time I move it. I'm, I'm, I'm having, and he was suffering from like anxiety at that time. So Connor goes like, listen, why don't you go to the Alps, relax with your girlfriend, take a break, and then come back. Maybe you'll feel better. And that's exactly what Gus did. And he took off because uh, he used to ski a lot. He used mm -hmm. to go to the Alps with his wife, Margaret, at the time. Uh, so he did a lot of that. And that's where he kept a lot of his money in Swiss banks. Uh, I mean, the guy was like a multimillionaire. Yeah, it's amazing how much money this guy made. Uh, but his brother was with him too, Sam. Sammy Alex, right? Sammy Alex. He's a he was called Slim, and uh, I think it was Slim. And, no, no, wait. Gus Gussie was Slim, and Sammy was something yeah. else. Yeah, he was. I forgot the nickname they gave him, but uh, yeah, Sammy ran a lot of stuff for uh, for his brother. Um, and there was. Um, Another gentleman, I can't remember his name. Oh, no, it was Gus Zappas. Gus Zappas was also under Gus Alex. And there was a lawyer, Frank Regano, yep. who represented a lot of guys in Chicago. 
and there was I forgot the other guy's name. There was another a Jewish guy that was with Regano. It was Lenny, Lenny, Lenny Patrick. No, a different guy. Whole other different guy. guy. Okay. Different guy. His name is Al something. I can't remember the last name. And they were out to dinner at a ballroom, very fancy restaurant. It was Gus Zappas, Frank Regano, and this other guy. Now the other guy was it Alan Dorfman? Maybe it was Alan. Maybe it was Alan Dorfman. Okay. And there was a woman there that was with them, and I think the woman was somebody somebody else's girlfriend or something. And Dorfman disrespected her. He was like looking at her ass, all that kind of stuff. And Zappas didn't like that. So he told he turned over to Regano and he says, "Listen, if you want me to take care of this, I'll bring this guy to the roof and throw him off." <laughs> and Regano said, "This guy's freaking insane." <laughs> Well, you know, he, people, you know, sometimes the mythology and the, and the romanticism can sometimes blur reality. And you look at a guy like Gus Alex from, you know, from an outsider's perspective and say, well, he wasn't Italian and he wasn't a made guy, but Gus Alex was powerful, was more powerful than 99% of the made guys he mm-hmm. was, for all intents and purposes, he was Accardo's consigliere. Accardo trusted him more than he trusted most of the Italians that he sought for counsel. Um, and this guy was, like you said, I mean, in the in the world of, of the Chicago mob, over the last 100 years, if you, if you were going to do a ranking system of who had the most juice, I mean, he makes the top, at least the top 10, if not the top five, and he's not Italian. Yeah. <laughs> But the other, there's only one guy didn't like him. Right. Sam Giancana didn't trust him. Right. And I know why. Because Sam Giancana's daughter, Antoinette, married a Greek guy who was uh, who's, who did abortions. And Sam Giancana hated him. Antoinette actually converted to be Greek Orthodox because <laughs> uh, Sammy didn't want his daughter to be with him. And since that time, he never trusted Greeks. And he Gus Alex was one guy he did not trust at all, but he had to do business with him. He didn't have a right. choice because Ricardo liked him, and uh, that's a, it's a funny story how that how God, Sammy's <laughs> opinion of him. <laughs> well, Nick, this was awesome, man. I had a really good time. Thank you for joining us to talk about uh, Greek mob guys. I want to have you back, and we can chop it up again and let everybody uh, know where they can find you. You have a great book. Uh, Mafia ties, prison rules. Uh, let, let let people know about the other stuff that they can find on you. Well, yeah, uh, Mafia ties is called Mafia ties to Greek syndicates, uh, which is about exactly what me and Scott just talked about, but more. Yeah. I talk about guys in Florida and in Texas and whatever. Um, that is actually being republished by a Canadian publisher, and it should be out in a month. Okay, uh, good. A whole, a whole new version and the older one. I put a lot of new content in there. Um, so Mafia Ties, Greek Ties is one of them. Uh, Greek Syndicates is one of them. Uh, Destinies and Destinies Part 2. Those are fiction. And then there's Prison Rules that I did with the ex-bodyguard of uh, John Gotti Jr., Johnny Lee. Oh, you, you wrote that with John A. Lee. Okay, John got it. A. Lee, that's correct. Yeah, that's called Prison Rules. Well, check that out. I, uh, you know, Nick is the best. You can tell. I, I should have probably kept my mouth shut a little bit more and just given Nick more of the oh, floor. Oh. I just love, I love talking about this stuff so much, but Nick is the experts expert on this stuff. And uh, I love giving people like Nick uh, an opportunity for, at least for my audience to, to let them know about these little, you know, pieces and, and spaces and nooks and crannies of this world. You can only get so much. There's only so much John Guidi and Whitey Bulger and Al Capone that we can consume. And I, I love finding the, the lost stories. And this was great. Awesome. Yeah, it was great also, man. And, uh, and I got to give uh, credit to you as well. Scott is a great writer. I love his work. And uh, Thank definitely, you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let, let everybody know where they can find you on socials. Oh, um, well, Facebook, just put Nick Christopher's and you'll find me okay. pretty quickly. Um, Instagram, you know, Nikki underscore Nick 50. Uh, that's an Instagram tag. Uh, and just nickchristophers.org is the website. And, you know, if any guys, if anybody is interested in any of the books, signed copies, that is, they can just email me at nickchristophers50 at gmail and we can make arrangements. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. 
We will uh, chat soon. And the next time I'm in your neck of the woods, I'm going to give you a call. We'll go uh, get some coffee and a story. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Uh, for, for, for my man, uh, Nick Christophers and Benny Behind the Glass, thank you for checking out another long-form edition of the Original Gangsters podcast. Please like, subscribe, share, spread the word. We'll keep on giving you the great true crime content, breaking news across the underworld. All day, every day, 24-7. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod. I'm out.